same topic, uh, which is called here solving camera orientation in the age of machine learning. So I will talk about uh, finding uh, some uh, computer vision models. At the beginning, will be more applied mathematics, and at the end, we will come to to a little bit of machine learning too. So uh, the the this talk sort of covers some uh, results which are coming from four papers which have been recently published at computer vision conferences. It's like from 2019 up to uh, the, the one which is upcoming next week. And I will just cover the main results from that. Okay, so the motivation for all this work is basically 3D reconstruction from images. So we have a few videos showing the background. So on the left, top panel, we see some kind of a sequence of, of images, which were taken somewhere in Chen Kyoto by my students. Top right, you see 3D points in space, which have been which were reconstructed by uh, structure from motion and things I will be talk about. Uh, left bottom, we see like a mesh, which is uh, put on top of the points and top right, uh, bottom right, we see just colored mesh and something which looks like uh, nicely. Uh, this has, of course, many applications, and perhaps you are most uh, familiar one for you would be like, a, you know, aerial photography and reconstruction of terrain and 3D mapping, and this is all what we know. So this uh, this video is coming from a uh, startup, which was actually founded by my former PhD students, Capturing Reality, uh, recently also was acquired by Epic Games, US uh, large gaming company. And they do basically 3D reconstruction from images. So something similar what you see on Google Maps. And another application, which is very uh, frequent in our world is some kind of autonomous driving, autonomous robotics and so on, where robots are moving around, they have cameras, they reconstruct the world and either to, to somehow assess where they can go or uh, and primarily also for uh, measuring where they are and how they should move and how they move. Another uh, important application we are involved in is like uh, post-production, that means uh, trick movies. So this is an example from some French post-production company, Micros Image. Uh, they basically do 3D reconstruction, augmented, create artificial things. So uh, basically most of movies which we see today are somehow combination of real and uh, things like that. So these are applications. So to be able to do the 3D reconstruction, we need to sort of estimate the geometry of the world. And we also need to estimate the, the camera. So here you may see a picture that we have the 3D reconstructed object. And then these, these wedges flying around are actually cameras which were taking the images and which were reconstructed as a part of the process of 3D reconstruction of the scene. Uh, the, this reconstruction pipeline is like a classical these days computer vision kind of uh, endeavor which starts with input images, then does some kind of image matching. These days, usually based on machine learning, uh, finding features, looking at similar features and putting tentative, what we call tentative correspondences, which are based on the similarity features and which are in large uh, numbers of them are usually wrong. So there's a mixture of correct matches and wrong matches. To filter out those wrong matches, uh, the standard approach to use some kind of camera geometry behind models which are coming from the geometry of the cameras. And the idea is that we will fit these models to the data and we'll select the largest subset of, of data points, I mean, the largest subset of matches, which is consistent with some model which we fit. And this is done in kind of a random sampling, which is like, a, a, I would say, combinatorial optimization uh, task, which tries to, uh, which does the following. It draws like some small number of, of data and reconstruct that, that camera geometry, which is here depicted as two cameras seeing five points. So this is like the classical example. We have four points in space. You have two cameras. If you see projection of five points, one can compute the relative pose of these cameras. And then once this is available for a five, five tuple, I can estimate or I can measure how many other points are consistent with that configuration and score that configuration, right? So I have in all together, I could draw like and choose five different kind of configurations for all five tuples in my data set. And then I could score each of that configuration and then pick the one which is supported by the largest number of other data. 
And this is actually very, very successful and robust approach. This is called RANSAC, random sampling consensus, and this is done. So in this process, one element is to compute that configuration of cameras from those five points in this case, right? So this is a computational problem, geometric, algebraic computational problem, which is the key thing inside, which must be solved. N choose five, if you take N is like N to five, since so there are lots of computations to, 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 to do for your image. And therefore this is very critical element. And this is what I will talk about in the next, because this, in this particular case and many other cases, the models that need the configuration of cameras is exactly fixed by the five point, not less, not more. So we say, we call this problem, computational problem, minimal problem. Minimal means that we have as few points as we need to be able to fix the model. So examples of these minimal problems, I will now talk about. So the, the simplest minimal problem to solve is to fit the lines through two points, right? Two points exactly determine one single line. So you can solve it by taking two linear polynomials and solve it thing and get the solution. What is not minimal is, for instance, like having one point and fitting a line, right? So there's a too few points. So there'll be infinitely many lines going through that point. So this is not minimal. And it's also not minimal if you have three points which are not on a line, then there is no line going through them. So it's again, not minimal, right? So, so you have to have the right number of points, right number of data to give you a finite number of solutions. In this particular case, just one, but sometimes maybe more, as you see later, to get your minimal problem. So minimal problem is some kind of a keyword which appeared in the computer vision community. And this is what we have. So what we talked about before already was this five point problem. That means we have a two cameras, see five points in space. So we have like image on the left, image on the right. We have these five points that are corresponding points. This guy corresponds to that guy and so on. This must be known, the correspondences. And for that, we can compute these, uh, these positions. Now compute means that we are solving I will show later some system of polynomial equations. We are comp solving the complex numbers because that's what give us a kind of regularity that everything behaves the same way. And this particular program, for instance, has four, has 20 solutions in complex numbers. So you can get 20 different combinations, configurations. Some of them are complex, so you can throw them away. Some of them don't fit other data at all. Some of them have, have some support from other data. So this is one classical problem. Now, for us, this minimal problem, like definition is a 3D reconstruction problem, which is minimal if the number of solution is finite and bigger than zero, and it works for generic data. So small noise in images don't kill the problem, does not make it infeasible. And the solutions in this particular case was a camera pose, rotation and translation, but also 3D points in the space. So the coordinates of five points in the space in some chosen coordinate system. So now, um, so this is the this is the background, right? These are the programs. And now some, some interesting research questions which we which we had. Like the question is: so let's say that we have points in space, also lines in space and incidents, so make it a little bit compli more complicated. And we have those what we call calibrated perspective cameras. So we know the focal lengths, we know the size of the pixel, kind of and these things. And the question here is how we can classify all the minimal problems which there are under the condition that everything which is in the space is seen in all images. So there is no occlusion, there is no missing detection, everything. So everything that is in space goes to images. So here I would let like three, five lines in space and one point, and they all get projected all in all my end images. And now the question is, well, now then we have a situation that we, we can, from this data, get models or problems which have exactly finite non-zero number of solutions. So it's like classify all such problems. So I was had two cameras, there was one problem. Now, can we say anything about it all together? Like, can we really classify? And indeed we can. So this is a table, which is surprisingly small. There's only 30, 30 cases. And this table consists of some, some pictures. So the, the top number here is the number of cameras involved. So here down is number two. So this guy is actually the one which we saw before the five points. So this, this cartoon says there are five points in space and also five points in both images, number two, and the number of solutions in complex number is 10. And this is, and then we see that we go from two cameras up to six cameras. There is nothing for seven cameras. If there are seven cameras, there is too much measurements so that the problem is over-constrained, it's not minimal. 
So this is like something which, which we were able to classify. And of course, some of them were known like this one. This was the one which we talked about before, but many others were, were not were somewhat known in some mathematical literature, but most of them were not known. So we have now full classification of this, this situation. Now, the next thing was to, uh, to look at the situation where something can disappear, right? So, so not all detectors in images are perfect. They just don't detect them, just, just miss it. So now the question is what happens if we miss it? Or there may be occlusion, so, right? So from one view you see it, from the other view you don't see it. So this is a much more complicated situation because we have like partial observations and many, many more combinations and possibilities what to do. But this is an example, like see images, we have like four points, this guy missed the point, and this guy missed the line. So we have this, these all possible configurations, all possible possibilities. And as before, uh, with the complete visibility, we had like maximum six cameras and there was nothing more for six cameras. Here, this is not, not the case, that any number of cameras can work because you can always say move sufficiently many things so that everything get balanced kind of and works. So to be able to do anything at all now, and to progress, we said, well, let's look at the simplest kind of interesting case, which are three cameras. Because actually two cameras are well actually covered by the complete visibility. But three cameras has to become interesting. So we take three cameras. And then there are still infinitely many of those minimal problems. So many still infinitely many. So we have to somehow manage this infinity of possible cases. And the idea is, of course, to create some equivalence classes and then classify those equivalence classes. And in order to be able to do it, we still had to take into account some kind of a constraint that each line in space can be incident to maximally one point, right? So, so this is some, some constraint. So, so if I have two points and line, why is it that? Because if you start to think like points and connect multiple points with lines, then this brings additional complexity that everything is influencing everything and the thing becomes very complicated. So this was the constant. So three cameras now, one line in space or each line in space adjacent at most to one point. And under this, we can classify and get, get those classes. And the number, is, the answer was that there are 74,575 different classes this time. So it's of course, uh, one could wonder how could we do this, right? So this is of course, compute by, this is all kind of generated, verified by computers. So it's not manually verifiable, but there's a lots of kind of, uh, um, lots of theory behind that. And many of these, many of these uh, things, of course, have many, many, many solutions. And the more solutions you have, the worse it is, you know, more difficult it is to compute it, right? So, so if I have a problem, we just like just few solutions, a quadratic equation, two solutions, easy to get quadratic equation. We have polynomial of degree 100. It's much more difficult to compute the solutions numerically of a polynomial of degree 100. It's possible, but it's much more complicated. Here we have guys which have thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousand solutions if you classify them. So these are maybe not interesting, but it's interesting those which have a low number, right? So for instance, we see that out of that big number, only like one tenth sort of has less than 300 solutions. And there are some kind of uh, count numbers of those which have so few solutions. So this kind of what to, you know, this, this 64, 80, I mean, this 300 solutions is something which is doable. And I will show how we can do it. It's doable. It was not doable, let's say 10 years ago, but these days we can, we can go for it. So this one is interesting, like 160, but lots of these guys. Um, then there are some, 51 problems which have no incidences are also interesting. And this, these things are, are interesting, but they still have like a larger number of uh, solutions or the harder problems that what we were able to do up till now. The classical methods, I will not explain them, some kind of symbolic numeric methods, they can deal usually with something like tens of solutions up to let's say 64, up to 100. But if you go beyond 100, then these things become too difficult computation becomes too slow and it doesn't fit the framework of ransacking and trying to compute many, many moves. So now I will show some technology which we developed, which can address solving these problems with many solutions. And then later I will show how to avoid solving many solutions altogether in some cases. 
So there are some two problems. One which has like uh, three points and two points has some lines through it. Right. There's a 312 solution, which is a phone, phone uh, prefix of Chicago. So then the problem is called Chicago. And there's another one to 16, that's Cleveland. And that's a little bit different. There are three points on a line. There is no incidence, just something like that. So it, these are examples. So what you see in three images, you have like points here and you have some lines. You have detect them in those three images. This is like a real situation. These images are slightly different, not very much, but they are slightly different. And this is a Cleveland, again, three different images. I will see if you can detect this. From that, we can solve the relative pose of those three cameras. And we know uh, up to common scale. And we, we know how what is, the, what is the geometry of the scene. And these things we can solve roughly in half a second by by somewhat optimized classical method, which is called homotopy continuation. So it's a numerical method for solving polynomial equations. I will explain just the gist of that. The idea is that you interpolate, you drag from a known problem where you, which you can solve to a new problem which you can't solve. So let's say that here, we have at the beginning problem called G. Let's say that G has four, different solutions. This is a para G has four different solutions. You can imagine that this is the force root of unity. Force root of unity. So four points on a unit circle in the complex plane. Everyone knows how to get these solutions. We know it. And here on the right is some, some generic degree four equation. We don't know, of course, solutions at the beginning. So the idea is to take that system G and system F and do kind of an affine combination of them. Start this parameter t at zero, then you get g. If t is one, you get something gamma f. Gamma is some kind of a small trick, which is to make sure that you are, you are working in complex space. There is some important thing that this must be done in complex numbers. There's enough space to, to go along this path and somehow avoid singularities. So, but in fact, the, the point is that you just, just kind of do it and how, what does it mean to, to do this, right? What does it mean? It means that at every point you get a new H for every T and you solve that H. But you don't solve it from scratch. You somehow drag the solutions from the previous step and update them in the next step. H is shown here. So let's say this is the zero solution, zero point, the zero system. And then you kind of have the solutions here, are the solutions, you predict them. This is in one deep, of course, in maybe multiple dimensions. You predict them somehow, like a tangent to, to that path, which the solution does in space. If you drag it, you get off the solution space, and then you up numerically Newton method update it and go back to the situation. And this is repeated again and again. And this way, you alternate this predictor corrector. You can call it Newton plus plus, and basically do this, this is what they call homotopy continuation. Now, <clears throat> there is a theory which says that if this pass is somehow sufficiently generic, you will find the solution of the final thing. So this is like mathematically correct method. If that, and if done with some special control of these steps and everything, this can, this can be used to prove that something exists. We don't do it, of course, this way. We are brutal engineers. So we just tune the parameters to make it fast and not to fail too often, but, but, we, but it can be done as a provable technique. This is kind of a cartoon which shows something like down here is the parameter space, let's say coefficients of the polynomial. Here is just a line goes through it, we interpolate. And here upstairs, this, these surfaces are somehow depicting surfaces on which are these passes of the solutions. So here are the solutions on the vertical axis. And the red thing here are some places where are singularities in this predictor and corrector step, there are Jacobians involved and these Jacobians make it singular and then it's still working. So you have to avoid these singularities. And the mathematical uh, theory says that there is always a path how to avoid a singularity, infinitely many of them. So this is always possible, but it must be done in complex space, right? So you have to be in complex space, there's enough space. If it was done in a real numbers only, then you, you, you would be hitting the, these singularities because the singularities basically are always appearing if you change the number of so real solutions, right? If you have like a, like a quadratic, quadratic equation which has two real solutions and no real solutions, 
to complex conjugate, then you have to hit the singularity and then going from two AO to no way. So, so, but if you are in complex space, you can circumvent this problem and go around. So this is why the standard homotopy continuation people, they already they love to work in complex space, right? They want to do everything because they want to find all solutions. Okay, so with this, we, uh, we can use this technology, uh, build solvers for, for those two problems. We get like 200 plus and 300 plus solutions. And if we track all the passes, so we have to start with 200 or 300 solutions and track 300 passes through and then get 300 solutions in a new situation. And um, then we can, we can get actually quite stable solver, but not super fast. Half a second is not uh, acceptable time for embedding such a thing into a ransacking procedure. Because if I want to do, let's say 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 samples, different test, different models per image, an image is coming like 20 times per second, I just can't fit half a second computation in them. Or if I have millions of images or hundred thousands of images to reconstruct the whole city, which I can do on, on, on a large computer, but still this is lots of computation. So I have to try to be fast. So the computation times we like are by below, my, below millisecond, something like a hundred microsecond. Hundred microsecond is good time. And we will try to get, how to get to hundred microsecond. That's the next, next question. And that's this. That's basically this uh, last piece of the talk. And uh, this is something which will appear now at CDPR. This this paper and this basically try to somehow relax thing and to avoid this very costly computation of all solutions. Why? Because all most of these solutions, except for one, all other solutions are just spurious. They are just artifacts of the formulation. They they will be thrown away anyway after. So we first like take a problem, relax it to get uh, something which we understand, a system of polynomial equations. Then use a technique which solves general system of polynomial equations, and then then we solve it, and then we throw everything else. Then one one result away. So there's a lots of Lots of ways, lots of efforts to to do something, and then then just say, then just you know use just tiny part of it. And uh, exactly, minimal original problem is has some non equalities which we can we cannot use. And now we we get this uh, one solution. Uh, many are spurious. One is is useful usually, or very small number of them, and that's it. so Chicago. Oh, sorry. Oops. Yeah. The computer is a little bit good. So, right, so this is the classical situation. So, I have my problem, it has 312 solutions. So, I fabricated some prototypical problem I know solutions of. I, new problem comes, and I, I homotopy from the original one I know to my new one. I do it on all 312 passes. I trade that, and then I test these all 312, or maybe some of them are complex, so I can throw them away. Some of them are not, so I test them with other data and select the one which is best. But actually, only one is really the one which I'm interested in. So now the question is how to how to just you know remove this unnecessary work done here on all these passes and got only one. So the the idea was just let's try to learn where to start so that we end in the right side. It might be possible, might not be possible, may sound like crazy, but that was the idea and, and let's see what we can do. So we have this Chicago in that case, then we would have some kind of a model which gets in the input, that means coordinates of those points and lines in those three images, and it will spit out which starting point out of 312 we should use, and where from which we should go. And then we would track only one path. Another thing is that uh, this could be done in, in complex numbers, but we know that we want to arrive to real ones anyway, and we will start with the real ones. So of course, that doesn't mean that we should not go through the complex, but we decided, no, let's forget it. We will start with the real and go to real. So we will do only real homotopy. We will live in a real space. Everything will be faster. We, have, we can compute with the real numbers, not these complex numbers, makes things faster. 
So that, that's another thing. Of course, we may fail more often, because we may hit some singularity, but because we are training, because we are anyways training where to start, so in that case, we will perhaps need to learn more points where to start, so not to, uh, to avoid these singularities. And this is what we did. And we were able to sort of get uh, a result, which is useful and which is fast. So the input now are the coordinates of, for one of the problems, here it is like, Four, four points seen in three cameras. So we have four times two coordinates in, in, in uh, three times four coordinates on four points to, to get a 20 dimensional space. This is somehow pre-processed and that will take like five microseconds. Then we have a model which, which takes this data and spits out the initial point to start from. And then we will do kind of a homotopy continuation. And altogether this, There'll be five, which is 20 plus 80, which is 100, 100 microseconds. Well, this is old slide, so these days it's like 70 microseconds, but basically doesn't really matter. It's, it's something which, which, is, uh, which, which works like that. But of course, it's a, lear it's a machine learning thing, right? So it doesn't work always. So it has to be trained on some data. So you take data on which you train it. In this particular case, we took some standard ETH 3D data set, which is like a well understood data set, which has 3D points, cameras, and so you can simulate and basically use it to generate new, new data. And what we do, we sort of uh, formulate it as a classification problem. So we, we take uh, these cameras, the configurations of triplets of cameras, and we give us those problems. We somehow connect them by, by a graph where this edge means that we can homotopy from one to another. Not, not all two such problems can be reached by, by a real homotopy because if you hit the, the, the singularity, then it dies, or if the, something fails because numerical, whatever. So this is empirical observation. If I can get from one point to another, it's good. If not, it's not good. So I have this graph. Maybe I have nodes which have 100,000 or million of different problems. On that, I'm putting this graph, and then I would like to make it simple. And the simple thing is to find a subset of vertices which are somehow covering all these all these other vertices. So they are, they are basically connected to many other vertices. So I want to do this what they call minimal cover, which is a standard graph problem, uh, which is uh, which is combinatorial. So there are some greedy algorithms which can deliver you something which is a good approximation. And we select those red points, which we call anchors. And those guys are actually those which we start from. And the network basically does it. It gets input data and picks the anchor from which you want to start doing homotopy and homotopy. So this is what the model does. And now there are some, uh, some, some variations. But what is important is that we are somewhere in tens of microseconds. This guy is. Is a variation which is a little longer, but these are uh, tens of microseconds. But these guys don't have like 100% success rate. So they fail. They fail quite often, actually. They fail like, you know, in they, they are succeed in 20, 25% and so on. So this seems like useless at first look. But it's not, fortunately, because in that RANSAC scheme, you sample new and new models. And on some it fails, and on others it basically succeeds. That's of course empirical observation. It might be that this is not the case, but it is the case. So this kind of a, you know, this kind of a uh, drawback of this approach, which means that not every configuration can be solved, can be somehow remedied by having more samples for a given camera from from those images. And basically, what it means that instead of one sample, you have to do four samples. So basically we have to multiply by four these numbers. And in this case, it will be bigger than 100 microseconds, but this some, uh, some improvements lately we got to this 80 microseconds on four samples. So basically this is very, very practical at the moment. Uh, still, we are working on getting it in, in, incorporated into existing pipelines to see what will, what will happen. So it's ongoing work, but uh, the, the important thing is that there are many interesting geometrical problems that are hard to solve. That means they have many solutions when they formulated algebraic problems in complex numbers. And, but learning this homotopy 
continuation, this where to start the local method, we would say where to start your Newton method, where you start your homotopy is basically the same thing, uh, can actually uh, avoid going for all these solutions and then throwing out what is not useful. And in fact, this in some sense opens a way to solve very difficult problems because we don't really care if it's as 100,000 solutions or whatever solution, even, even infinitely many, even components which are not finite because we simply need to pick the right one and check one. So, and this seems to be the case. So we are working on some additional problems and, uh, and it seems to be very similar. So uh, we believe that this is a breakthrough in, in minimal problem solving because then this uh, spurious number of solutions for a classical technique, which are based on Gerbner basis on elimination, there you have to deal with them all the time until the last second, the last step, maybe even in the last step often. And this makes it, of course, infeasible because let's say that you turn it into eigenvalue program computation and you have 10,000 by 10,000 matrix to compute eigenvalues from. And this is not, not a feasible task for, for any practical real time application, not even non real time application. So this is it. Okay. So, and I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Are there any questions from audience or from online? Sorry. Okay. Um, quite I find it interesting because uh, currently we work with satellite images that are acquired, I don't know, daily or that it's turning to video recording. Yes. And probably for this application, your solution would be uh, very interesting. There are already some sensors uh, in orbit taking the uh, videos. But uh, one of the remote sensing problem is that there is often more occlusion than information. How does your solution would work in such a situation where we've got too many clouds, which are uh -huh basically preventing to get the information you had a, uh, at the beginning you had a one example you had a five points and one was occluded yes but what if there are more than half of these included actually yeah the, the, for this one the important thing that you have you, you are able to find some small number of points which are which are in an expected configuration right so if let's say half of the points is open, that's not so big big deal because you still have lots of points from which to pick your five or something so this is this. Is, what was maybe important is that if you, in the first piece where I was talking about these safety problems, then you, nothing can be occluded, and this is maybe tricky because then nothing can be occluded anyway, right? Everything must be there. But the second piece was that we, we can get occluded things, so of course you can miss something, but still you have to have enough kind of data to be able to compute something. But but there are many different cases and many different situations, but. But basically all this works as, as long as you have at least the minimal sample in your images. So if half here is occluded, half there is occluded, and something that there is still some non-empty non intersection is there, then this, this is only with half. But of course, if you have no common things in those images, then of course this technique does not apply. But, but, uh, but still, I mean, of course, this is extreme situation. Right? As soon as we have complete coverage by clouds, we are basically yeah. lost. So it depends really on the distribution of the clouds. Yeah, it depends, of course. But but still, as soon as you are able to pick some of the data, somehow, at least few, I mean, few, practically, let's say, thousand different possible configurations, then this usually works. Like in normal situations where you photograph on the ground and things like this, or aerial stuff also, the number of those models which is tried is not n choose five and choose something, but it's just fixed number, randomly sample. A thousand is a good number. Mm -hmm. Five hundred is a good number. So it's not that big number. Of course, it may happen that none of them is good, and you need to increase because, of course, there's a randomization. So mm -hmm. the chance to hit the good model is something. But uh, the more samples you do, the chance, the higher the chance, right? But but people use things by like thousand. Thousand is a number. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so, but still, you have to have some. 
But I still think that this is like largely applicable, of course. Not always, but large. And it's used, right? So all if you if you look like all these things, like aerial stuff, which, which I know, like which is in Google and which is which capturing like that, is basically a running pipeline on it's basically running something like that with some of these minimal problems, which are actually well developed. So the one for five points. Um, and then implement it carefully. So this, uh, the fastest implementation I know of is like 2.5 microsecond, but that's a very simple problem actually. That's a problem which is simple. Yeah. I see the time constraint is not the case of uh, the application and Earth observation, but uh, the, the video is coming. Yeah, yeah, video, but when you have video, there are so many images. Mm -hmm. I mean, even now you have many images, right? So you have to, if you want to process them all together, of course, the pipelines are not doing this at every image. Usually, pipelines start with few images, try to do kind of seed, which is solved by this relative pose and this computation. And once you have a piece of reconstruction, few points and a few cameras, and you have other cameras, then you try attach those cameras to the points to kind of absolute post camera post computation with respect to existing reconstruction, which is also a minimal problem, but simpler, one, much simpler one. Mm -hmm. And also maybe so 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 it's much faster. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there are no more questions, I thank you very much again and thank you. Yeah, thank you. We will continue with the next talk. It's Carmelo on the test observation for the dynamic forest atlas of Europe. It should be open. Okay. No, it's it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Come on, Boris. Thanks. So, as uh, Yukesh mentioned, uh, in this talk, we are going to see how to use machine learning and net observation data for the production of dynamic three species distribution maps for Europe. And these are is a product that was developed uh, thanks to the Germanizer project. Uh, so this is a bit of the outline of the talk. So the, the talk was going to be split in like four main parts. So first, a little bit of a context on what species distribution model is, and then we're going to see what kind of data set did we use, what kind of predictive variables, what's the modeling framework. We're going to see some of the results uh, of the paper that it's. Uh, uh, in the second round of revision right now, so it's going to be accepted uh, soon. And we're going to also give a small demo uh, on the Open Data Science Data Viewer. And for some of you, some things uh, were already examined in the workshop or in the training sessions. And some of these things instead are completely new. So I hope uh, you can see applications of what uh, we mentioned already in the art training session. So what's uh, uh, in this case, we are going to see species distribution model and particularly correlative species distribution models, which uh, basically assign uh, specific predictive variables that we are interested in to the location of uh, the chain point, which in this case is the target species we're interested in. And then a model is uh, fitted to these uh, points and it's then predicted to the region of interest, which in our case was the whole continental Europe for the time period from 2000 to 2020. So in this case, we both modeled the potential and the realized distribution of the species. So as you can see from uh, this little graph, uh, we can consider the potential distribution of the species, all the environmental conditions that a species can uh, cover in both the geographical and then the environmental space. While the realized distribution is a constraint uh, a space in both the geographical space and environmental space where these things happen just because there may be competition between the species or the uh, area is not suitable anymore thanks to uh, human alteration or predation by other species uh, for example or uh, uh, extreme events like wildfires or wind storms and so on and so forth so this is an idea of what's the, the state of the art for uh, some species in Europe. The, it comes from the European Atlas of Forestry Species. This was the baseline that we started with. 
And you can see here on the right, a chorological map of the species, which is mostly uh, a polygon that's drawn based uh, from historical reconstruction of uh, botanical records. While instead the maximum amount of suitabilities a map here on the left is a probability map that categorizes uh, different areas in Europe based on the survivability or not for a specific species. Uh, unfortunately, these maps are uh, very low resolution from one to 10 kilometer scale. And there is only one map for the whole Europe, which is not referenced in time. So that's the problem that we started to solve, both high resolution and uh, more spatial coverage. This is an overview of what's the um, modeling framework and the data that we use. You can see here the processes that were used to develop our training data sets. On the, here on the left, you can see which covariates did we use and the difference between which were used for potential distribution and which for realized distribution, uh, the complete machine learning framework, and the outputs. Uh, so we start analyzing what the data set is, and then we're passing on the modeling frame. If you want more detailed information, of course, you can check the preprint. Uh, I leave all the details in the slide, so you can uh, consult the links whenever you want. Um, there is, as I said, the difference between the potential and the realized distribution, and this also uh, comes not only in which predictor variables we are choosing for uh, the modeling part, but also which uh, training points are we going to use. So in this case, the presence data set, so the uh, occurrence of the points is mostly the same, while the absence data, which informs the model of all the areas where the species cannot occur, has a specific difference between the potential distribution and the realized distribution. Uh, so we call true absence all these points where we know that uh, we're surveyed, we're sampled, where the species is not present. And in this case, we use the Lucas dataset. While in the potential distribution, we remove all these points that, for example, cover uh, urban areas or anything that's human related, like croplands. Uh, for the realized distribution, we use all the points. So in this way, we try to exclude all these areas where the conditions can be suitable, but it's not uh, a good place for the species to live right now because uh, something else is already there. Uh, more information on the data set is available here on Zenodo and on Open, Open Geohub website, where you can uh, download it and use all the code that we provided available to download and explore the data. There are already some uh, sample RDS files where you can do your own predictions, so you can test your models. And functions are also available. So if you want to fine tune the models, everything is already there. And also on the website, as you can see, there is available not only the points, but also the uh, all the maps that are also available and downloadable from the Open Data Science uh, Data Viewer. So what we did for the points was to uh, overlay first with land cover classification maps that were produced also uh, for the Geoharmonizer project. And we did a spatial temporal overlay of all these points, both uh, in this case, it was just to avoid specific problem on uh, the location and the occurrence of these points. And we built a forest mask that, was consist that consisted of the most prominent uh, forest related classes. So as you can see, uh, most of the points that then were used for the uh, training of the models uh, fell into forest. And that's what you see you can see here on the, the left. And this is uh, an ensemble of metadata from the three species data set. And this, uh, this process was particularly useful to exclude all these uh, points that, for example, come from citizen science project that uh, fall into cities or that have a location accuracy that's uh, very low. So for example, the point actually uh, uh, shows the three species, but just that the GPS location is so bad that basically the point falls out of forested areas. And this is what it looks like on the final data set. So you have an idea of the point, the year of, uh, from which the point comes from. Uh, if this point is actually, the year is related to the original data set, or if it comes from this post-processing uh, phase that we did with the overlay of the forest maps, and in which tile of the tiling system that we use for Europe, the point is located and which species it is. For the, uh, we used also all the other three species when modeling one target species uh, to uh, include into the model information about trees that it's not the species that we were trying to model. And we use different strategies to select which one could provide better results. 
One was to consider all the three species points and the Lucas points outside of the uh, recorded range of the species for the modeling. Another one was to consider the Lucas points in all the environment while all the three species that we had available were considered only if outside of the suitability area of the uh, target species. Other uh, less common strategies were to include all the points but limited to only the species that we are trying to model because we have more than 50 species in the data set but it's a huge amount of data so we just limited the analysis to 16. Uh, in this case, instead, we use just the Lucas points and no information on other three species was included. And uh, the difference between these two, as you can see, is the spatially thinning of the points because most of them are spatially clustered. So these may also bias uh, the model. On the uh, spatial thinning, you can see uh, some ideas of what it would look like in here. So as uh, for some species, for example, the cork oak, which is mostly cultivated in Spain, we have a 30 kilometer style with uh, more than uh, 140,000 points and the total of points is 300,000. So you can see that half of the data set is basically located in just one part of Europe. Uh, so these kind of clusters can influence and impair the model. Um, and among these points, of course, the Lucas data set is regular because it's based on a two by two kilometers sparse across all Europe. So what we did it was just to uh, try to regularize and homogenize the distribution of both the presence points and the absence points across all Europe. Since the, most of the true absence points come from Lucas, this process didn't influence their distribution a lot, but it helped regularize what's the distribution of the pseudo absence and the presence points. Information on how we did this process is related uh, to the SP theme package, which is uh, in our package explained in this paper. So if you want more information, please go ahead. Um, this is a bit of an overview of the covariates that we use. So we divided these covariates in four different macro groups, which are related to uh, long term averages or time series of climate. Uh, everything that's terrain related, like DTM, slope, elevation, the DTM derivatives, etc. cetera. Uh, reflectance data, so information that come from uh, optical satellites like Landsat or the spectral indices that are derived from them, and to include information about competition of other species other than using um, other three species location. We also use the three species distribution map, the chorological maps that you saw before, of all the other species, except, of course, the one from the target species, because that would influence badly the model. Uh, I will just go very rapidly across the covariates. This is, uh, for example, the bioclimatic variables. Here. So these are long-term averages of the last 40 years of um, temperature and precipitation mostly, or indices like continentality and so on and so forth, that we use to establish a, a baseline of the climatic conditions of the uh, uh, area of study. And they are all computed at one kilometer resolution, so they are very coarse. Um, the ERA-5 data set and this uh, enhanced uh, data set that was produced in the Geoharmonizer project was already examined in the days before and uh, basically includes a time series of air temperature and uh, surface temperature and precipitation across the whole time period, so from 2000 to 2020. And uh, we have, for each of the two temperatures that are available, we have both minimum, maximum, and average temperature. Uh, the biggest <laughs> source of information that we have in these uh, models come actually from the Landsat GLAD ARD, which is a harmonized version of all the Landsat data that is currently available and is uh, reprocessed in a way that each of these different satellites uh, show the same, let's say, uh, values across the whole time series. So if you uh, do time series analysis on Google Earth Engine with the Landsat data that's available there, be careful. Um, and we have all the covariates like a coast distance from the coastline. That's another information about the continentality of the species. And here is more details on which uh, geomorphometric variables we use to have a uh, baseline of what's the terrain conditions in the whole area. Going to the modeling framework, uh, we had uh, an overview first of the whole model. This is a specific part that's uh, not included in the final uh, framework, but it was just uh, a benchmarking analysis to uh, uh, decide which 
component models should have uh, been put into the ensemble model. Basically, the whole uh, the whole final model of uh, the study is an ensemble uh, model based on stack regularization, where the three learners that are were uh, selected across uh, a pool of different uh, learners, in this case seven, uh, were used to train three different models, and the output of these models were then used as training data for a final model, which is based on logistic regression, which constrains all the predictions to an interval that goes from zero to 100. And in that way, the output that we get is a probability map that goes from zero to 100%, where 100% is the certainty of probability of occurrence of the species. Uh, but, um, let's say about the feature selection, it uh, was originally implemented in Python. Now we can implement it in R as well. And it's based on a non-linear process, which is recursive feature elimination. So we use a specific model, in this case, a random forest, a very simple model. And we select a specific accuracy or performance metric we're interested in. In this case, we use the logarithmic loss. And the, basically, this process uh, the, um, analyzes all the variables that we have in the data set. And at each iteration, it removes, the, in this case, the less uh, you know, 10 important for So it uses the variable importance of uh, random forest as a selection uh, of most and less important for variables. And we uh, took the first minimum of this function and then repeated the operation five times because each time we run this operation on not on the whole data set, but on a subsample, otherwise it would take forever, even with good computers. And from there, we select the number and the uh, names of the covariates that we are going to use later for the final model. Um, here we have uh, an overview of the final results. So you can see that um, these are the results of the three component models. And these are uh, uh, aggregated values among all the species. And it's based on uh, R squared based on log loss. So values that are uh, next to zero basically tells you that the model is useless while next to one is that you have a perfect classifier and with this in this case of course you can see both potential and realized distribution and all these three models are perfectly optimized so you have uh hyper parameter optimization feature selection everything that you could do um and not only thanks to that uh we managed to train a model that's better than all three of them so at the end of the day, all uh, ensemble models outperform the, mm, the tuned individual models. What we can see also in here, this is just for a uh, realized distribution. We are mostly interested in this one, is that the distribution of specialist species that are either endemic or that cover a very small uh, niche in the feature space are easier to classify than more generalist or pioneer species, like mostly conifers, as you can see here, for example, for the Scott spine of the blend. And this is an overview of the data viewer of how the potential and the actual distribution of a specific species look like. For the potential, we just realized one map because as we said, this based mostly on long-term climatic averages. So we realized one map just for the last uh, time period of the uh, period observed in this study. So from 2018 to 2020, while for the realized distribution, we split the whole time period in different time slices. And we realize six different maps, each of them cover four years. So by clicking here, you can access to the data viewer. You can already see the map that we were looking at. You can see here the legend of how many probabilities. Now, uh, what's the legend for that? Let's say, for example, in areas that are above 90%, we can say that the species is for sure present there. Uh, in the case of potential, of course, and minus minus the ten percent is basically an idea that the species cannot live in that area. Of course, as we said, this is potential distribution, so this is the area that the species could cover if no other, let's say, forestry species were present in Europe, no cities were available, no uh, crop fields, no no other uh, roads infrastructure not anything else. And here you can see instead of comparison for the same period, so from 2018 to 2020, with um, the realized distribution of the same species. And then you can zoom in and you can check if your maps basically make sense or not. 
And this map can be used not only to uh, highlight this difference between what's possible and what's available, uh, but also to check, for example, if you turn off the comparison to analyze if the distribution changes over time. And in this case, of course, you have to select the realized distribution. And in that way, you can check, for uh, example, if the distribution of a specific species reduced its uh, space in the geographical space due, for example, to wildfires or other extreme events. Like now, for example, Germany in the last 20 years uh, had very serious uh, windstorms. So in some areas here in the Black Forest, across the years, you see a diminution of uh, probability of occurrence of that species that grows back over time. Uh, the same can be said for uh, Southern Europe for uh, wildfires event. And, or for example, here in, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, you may be more familiar with it, uh, with the uh, invasions of pests like bark beetles. So this is it. So if there are any questions, please go ahead. Okay, Carmel, thank you very much. And Zlida? No questions. Okay. No question online. Here's one question. Yeah. You mentioned something like 115 spectral mm -hmm. variables. Mm -hmm. Can you ah, give yes. more details? Basically, we use all the Lancet bands. So in this case, there are six bands plus the thermic bands. Mm -hmm. Then we derive spectral indices for all of them. And instead of having a specific value for each band, we aggregated them on a seasonal basis. So you have roughly every year a Lancet uh, image every 16 days. Then we aggregated this image on uh, like for four time periods across the year. So we had uh, seasonal data for months. So we have spring, um, spring, uh, summer, winter, fall. We decided oh, to not times four. Yes. And then we decided to not use winter because even with the harmonized collection, we have a lot of areas that are full with top gaps. So it was actually inserting too much noise in the model, especially for spectral indices, even after normalization. And then of all of these seasonal data, we split the distribution in three. So we calculated the first uh, 25th quantile, then the 50th quantile and the 75th, 75th quantile. This process is more uh, better examined in the paper about the land cover, because Leandro was the main uh, uh, author of this part. And then, of course, then this data set was used for the land for the cover product, where my time is there is the leading order. Any other questions? So I, I send you this uh, data portal they made, mm -hmm. also the forest monitoring. Mm -hmm. How does this compare to this work? Uh, the uh, uh, maybe it's better if you also show it to the people present for the wise that we can see. Can you put it in the chat? In the chat? No, okay. Can you go open this link? No, I think he just sent it in the file. Ah, ah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you, you read about it. I mean, how does it compare? The time series that's analyzed there, of course, is uh, not based on the harmonized data set of Lancet. And then, of course, you have to do trend analysis to see because that's not distribution maps, this is more like the forest cover. So it's a different product. Fine European, fine European forest map. So basically they only have to, whether it's forest or not. Yeah, it's forest cover. Okay. And it's different. Yeah, like in, the, in this kind of study, you have it's different right? things. Yeah, can you put it on the chat maybe? If it's Copernicus product, then you yeah. get several sub products distinguishing. Yeah, if it's the, forest, if it's forest without trees, and then yeah. a species in three or four groups. Yeah, then there are like Isn't trees it? outside forests. And basically, this uh, new study was analyzing that these Copernicus maps, they are a, a bit updated compared to Sentinel uh, products that are available now because they were produced in 2015 or 2018. So it's difficult to do uh, forest loss analysis with these maps, while, of course, like the last two, three years are not included. Yeah, in the... They only have one year, so uh, they have the broad leaves and coniferous forest. Yeah. But nothing about the density of forest. No. That's part of the high resolution by forest. Yeah. Which is 0 to 100. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Updated every three years. 
So of course, they cannot be used for like a real time monitoring. But no, 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 it's not the purpose. It's about the reporting. Exactly. So. Any questions? Okay. No more questions. If there are no more questions, thank you, yeah. Carmelo, for a nice presentation. And you move on. Before the presentation is uploaded, I just introduce it. The next talk is by, by Jana Bauerwan, and she will talk about the use of the open geodata in the humanitarian operations of the doctors without the borders. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Yana. I'm the Community Engagement and Communication Coordinator at the Czech Office of the Doctors Without Borders. You might be wondering who is this child? His name is Victoire or Victory and he is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. His mom brought him to the General Reference Hospital uh, in Angumo, which is an area in the northern part of the DRC, close to Lake Albert, that has experienced a lot of flooding. And there is also a lot of displacement because there are clashes of the coastline. So there are about 11 displacement and refugee camps. And uh, also with malaria, unfortunately, Often we experience outbreaks of uh, waterborne diseases or with uh, the diseases uh, from vectors, like from mosquitoes. So he was diagnosed with acute anemic malaria. And uh, when our nursing activity manager, Awa, saw him, she put him directly into the intensive care unit. She is uh, from Nigeria and uh, luckily she was in DRC for three months to share her expertise, normally based at Magaria Hospital uh, and started as a residential staff for MSF or the short shortcut in French, Médecins Sans Frontières, that's our international name. The first thing that Awa did was to put a catheter in his hand and uh, take a blood sample. So there's this blood group for donors. Unfortunately, his mom was not compatible. Several of his family members traveled to the hospital to be tested. I'll tell you the end of the story at the end of my presentation. These are just a few examples that we faced uh, of challenges in the last year. Drought and malnutrition, natural disasters like a volcano eruption, malaria that I mentioned, outbreaks of diseases and also neglected diseases like Noma, a facial infection, cyclones, and refugees and displacement, and flooding. South Sudan was one of the most affected. In all these contexts, we have met with the missing maps. It's a project that was funded precisely to help map the areas where vulnerable populations live that are prone um, to be affected by disasters or that are at risk of disasters in all of these countries. And we co-founded it with the British and American Red Cross and the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, an originally British NGO, which is now actually uh, placed also in different um, African uh, spots where they have open mapping hubs. So they have regionalized, they also have an Asian uh, open mapping hub. And then over the years, a bunch of organizations have joined. Now it's about 20. Why I put this on is because maybe you recognize some of the research institutes or organizations that you've partnered up with. Uh, so it might be good that you're aware that they are part of this uh, collaboration initiative. 
among uh, the mapping NGOs like Map Action or Youth Mappers, a network at something like 170 universities around the world, including Slovakia. I would like to mention the Heidelberg University and also the George Washington University. The Heigit um, is one of our closest partners and uh, they also teach courses um, in uh, open street map and in the use of humanitarian data and anticipatory action. The open street map spatial data help NGOs like ours respond to real world challenges natural disasters like tornadoes or flooding or earthquakes. And uh, in these cases, when the volunteers are mobilized, the area can be mapped within hours or within two days for our urgent medical projects, like for vaccination campaigns. The OSM data is used both for planning where to go and take samples, um, um, where to go and vaccinate, and then also for measuring the effectivity, where to take samples in order to see the percentage of those who had been vaccinated. And I will share one example of measles vaccination uh, later on. And then of course, getting the medical supplies to where they need them. So our GIS is actually integrated within logistics and it's the field that makes the request for uh, missing maps to be activated. And they usually also send the area of interest. Among the open map data creation and editing tools, I'd like to mention MapSwipe, a mobile app that you might not be aware of, where we upload big areas and then volunteers swipe on their phone and tap where they see buildings, or they can tap twice, we're not sure, and it'll turn orange, um, or three times when the data from the satellite is not good enough. And that enables us to create a grid like this in the hot tasking manager, which is, I think, now the fourth version from the original OpenStreetMap editor. The ID editor is actually integrated in this browser, uh, in this um, platform, uh, and within the same window in the browser. Then we use JOSM, uh, that's for more advanced mapping and uh, it's more powerful. And other editors like MapRoulette, especially for points of interest and wrap ID with the use of AI presets of data. And QGIS, and I forgot to put here also the Cobble Toolbox, which is used by our field teams for mobile data collection. What's the process of the missing maps data creation? Well, as the first step, Remote volunteers meet and they digitize imagery into OpenStreetMap after map swipe. So here I have an example of how this huge area with the red contours in northern Nigeria, Socrates State, was reduced to just those green areas. And at mapathons, the green areas actually create the tiles which the volunteers review and where they digitize building after building. So we organize these uh, about every month in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. For about a year and a half, we had mainly online mapathons, but lately we've moved to hybrid and also in-person mapathons. And then after also validation, that's the second step of the remote mapping or the third, if you found maps web as well, um, we add the field data. Uh, that's our staff in the field or sometimes the volunteers or the local mappers, because obviously from the satellite imagery, you can't use, you, can, you can't see the use of the buildings or how the settlements are called. So that's the information that the field teams get. In. Sometimes they also take GP extracts because some of the tertiary roads are not yet in the open street map or they would take points, for example, of the water sources like our Watson team. And then thirdly, the use of the humanitarian data. Uh, this is in Mozambique after the cyclone Idai, preparing for the emergency response. And the good thing with OpenStreetMap, of course, is that it's available for the government, for the other organizations in the area, and they can amend it. So it's a living set of data. It's not something static. Here is a snapshot of our support to the MSF operations in the first four months of this year. So you can see actually all of those challenges in there on bold, in bold um, flooding in South Sudan. And by the way, there have been 
um, more than one project. Um, in chat, uh, yellow fever and general health response, we've had also some emergency projects there that were not part of a long-term campaign. Um, I'll mention the measles vaccination survey next. And then often it's multiple activity support for planning our operations and what's some activities like um, overlaying with the data of uh, the water sources or even uh, deep water and then checking where they should go next, for example, for uh, making whales or finding other water sources or actually delivering um, canisters and so on if um, there, there isn't just a source of water. So to sum up what the geodata is used in our operations, first of all, it's for understanding the context. That's for the so-called explore, meaning the assessment before the projects are even developed. So usually a small advanced team is sent ahead and that's the moment where the volunteers would be activated in order to create reference maps or thematic maps um, like uh, for uh, health institutions or for example, for water for activity planning, obviously, and there it depends on what activity it is. We work with epidemiologists, for example, for the health activities, um, also for the situation monitoring and for reporting. Three cases. So um, our colleagues uh, contacted us that they are planning to do a field survey the next week. It was about a month ago. And uh, we created uh, two projects uh, on uh, the OpenStreetMap. And here you can see how volunteers mapped in Bongor and the speed at which they added buildings. So especially for Mapping at a level of cities uh, for small areas is very effective. Second example that I want to share with you is mapping that we initiated for the Explore last March. And it's my colleague who was an intern in Missing Maps and GIS coordinator, a South African, so he has a bit of a funny accent. At the distribution points, we've got many women waiting with their children. They've been walking four hours, even more, uh, which is obviously quite a big problem because it's very hot, very dry, uh, not a lot of water available. So using GIS and missing maps data, we can help improve the situation. So we were in the village the other day walking around and you can see the buildings that we passed and when we have all the buildings downloaded for a large area then we can go and do an analysis of the density of the buildings to show us where people are and also give us an idea of the density of the population. Then we can determine how far they are from health facilities uh, or water points. So there, it was important for the population density, actually, because there were already population data sets, which provinces, for example, have the most population, but seeing where really people are clustered then determined where the mobile clinics would go, for example, to find the malnutrition or where the food distributions would take place. Now, what can you do? You can help out in areas like where Victoria is from. Luckily, his grandfather was compatible and they quickly took blood from him and put a transfusion over the head of this boy. And in two days, he could already be moved to the continuing care ward. 
Angumu continues to be affected by malaria and we've used the so-called indoor residual spraying there to increase uh, the protection. It provides protection for about nine to 12 months when the dwellings are sprayed with an insecticide from inside. And for that, we actually need the mapping at the building level so that it can be used for dispatching the teams, which buildings they're going to visit, and on mobile phone they mark which buildings have been sprayed, which they could not access, or where they got the refusal. And that then is uh, put together at the end of the day by the GIS coordinator and taken into account for the next day's planning. We have the next marathon on the 28th of June. So if you're in Prague, you're welcome to join us. Uh, you can use this short link, bit.ly uh, slash Prague Mapathon. If you're interested to get involved in Missing Maps in any way, don't hesitate to send me an email. And if you just want to follow from distance what's happening, we have a Facebook group, a Missing Maps just for Southern School, or you can follow the Missing Maps on the social media. And now I would like to give space to questions or comments. Yes. Have we tried using the Facebook uh, population density maps at 30 meter resolution? So we have used some Facebook data sets, especially the roads and the wrap ID, uh, but I'm not aware that we would use that for buildings. Often the problem with the AI generated data is that the buildings are not drawn exactly where the buildings are, or uh, that in these areas were really needed by by the building level, it's not precise enough. But we do use um, remote sensing and AI generated area also within MSF. It's basically compatible with using maps. I'm just curious if you think that would this mean what they made because they put on the media this Facebook. Uh, so this this concrete set we don't use it within the missing maps context, but um, our colleagues uh, in the Vienna uh, spatial uh, team then they they do basically building generation with, with AI data set. So it's possible that they use it as well. Okay. And that's especially if we need it quickly, like for example, now in Mozambique or in DRC, there's big displacement uh, around Ruchuru. I'm hearing that's where actually the volcano eruption took place. So they, they are going to use that. And you just alert Africa by using their data? Again, it would be my colleagues from the GIS Center who are in the mapping team. Um, I'm not aware that they would use that, but they use all the available data sets, so probably they do. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I wanted to ask if you were linking to the UN at all, who were proposing mapping these. Great questions. Uh, question. Actually, yes, we, we have been in touch with the UN mappers, and they do also uh, mapathons. Um, we did not um, go ahead with sort of welcoming them to the family of missing maps because um, the approach to mapping is a little bit different and there are also UN peacekeeping operations. So there is sometimes association with the military that's not necessarily compatible with the Red Cross or MSF. However, they're very advanced in terms of tutorials and in terms of organization. So we share knowledge uh, and um, we also share when we are mapping in the same area and they are uh, preparing step-by-step -step, uh, tutorials in the six UN languages, as far as I'm aware, the map center that's in Italy. Uh, now I don't remember the exact name. So it, it kind of fits back into the open mapping communities. We are in touch and we cooperate. And sometimes when they map in the same area, they would write us comments on the projects. All right, great. I guess time for lunch. Yeah. Is <laughs> right. anything else lined up? Yeah. If there are not any questions, then uh, I thank you very much for a nice contribution, an interesting uh, talk. And uh, we can probably close this session and uh, continue at one o'clock, I guess. One thirty. All right. Yeah.